Hi, and welcome back to Mr. Raymond's Civic COC Academy, where today we will be looking at the executive branch of the U.S. federal government, headed up by the President of the United States. Now, last time we finished up our videos on Congress and the legislative branch with a video on how a law is made. So if you didn't catch that, go back to our channel and check it out. And today we will continue looking at the three branches of the federal government, as shown by our benchmark, which describes how we need to know about the structure and functions and processes of the executive branch. The three branches are a big part of your state exam, so we're going to continue spending a good amount of time on these. And to clarify this benchmark, the structure just means how the branch is organized, the functions are kind of how it works, and the processes just means the actions they need to carry out their jobs. And just a reminder, teachers, that this PowerPoint lesson plans are available at Teachers Pay Teachers. Just search for Mr. Raymond's Civics EOC account. Academy. So this is a great slide I found with an overview of the executive branch. So if you want to hit pause and write all this down, it might be a good thing. We're going to look at most of this in much more detail, but let's grab a couple of basics off of this. As you can tell, the president is the head of the executive branch. The term for the president, which means how long they serve, is four years, and they can serve a maximum of two terms. The qualifications to become president are that they must be 35, live in the country as a resident for 14 years and be a natural born citizen. They are elected in a system known as the Electoral College and that will be the focus of our next video. It's kind of complicated. In fact, all of those details we just covered, we are going to be looking at it in much more detail in our next video on running for the president. So when the president is sworn in, and this is right in the U.S. Constitution, they promise to, quote, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, and they also promise to faithfully execute the laws of this nation. And this is why we call this the executive branch. To execute means to carry out, and that is the job of the president and the branch, to carry out or to enforce the laws made by Congress. Now, the executive branch at the state level is headed up by the governor, and they control law enforcement just like the president does at the national level. They control law enforcement at the state level. So the governor is just like the president of the state, enforcing state laws. So now we know the president is the head of the executive branch, but do they do it alone? Not at all. The executive branch has become huge over the history of America. There are over 4 million employees that work for the U.S. executive branch of the federal government. 4 million, making this far and away the biggest of the three branches. Immediately below the president is the vice president, who runs for office with the president as kind of his number two. We think of the VP as just kind of a backup in case something happens to the president. But as we mentioned in our last video, the vice president is actually the head of the Senate, where they have a tiebreaker vote. And the vice president will often travel around America and the world, representing the country and the president. So they are definitely do more than just act as a backup to the president. Now, the VP is also part of the president's major advisors known as the cabinet. Cabinet officials referred to as secretaries, update the president about what is going on in their area of specialty. Here we see some of Obama's major cabinet advisors on education, energy, treasury, which deals with money, defense, and the attorney general, who is like the top lawyer for the federal government. There are 15 cabinet advisors, and each heads up a major executive department. Now, one thing you need to know for your test is that there is nothing about a cabinet in the U.S. Constitution. This tradition was started by the first president, George Washington, who decided to create these advisors. He had a secretary of war, a secretary of the treasury, Alexander Hamilton, again dealing with money and probably why his face is on our $10 bill, secretary of state Thomas Jefferson, and the secretary of state advises the president on what is going on around the world with other countries. Very important position. And an attorney general, remember, 
remember an attorney is a lawyer, so this is an advisor on legal matters. As you can see, the cabinet has grown significantly. There is still a Secretary of State, and Obama's first was Hillary Clinton, who again advised him about what was going on around the world, and who, by the way, is now running for president. There is no longer a Secretary of War, but a Secretary of Defense to deal with the military. The Interior Secretary deals with the land owned by the government, agriculture with farming, commerce is with trade, labor advises on the working people of America. America, health and human services with advice for medical care, housing and urban development, pretty much what it sounds like, transportation, think planes, trains and automobiles, energy, oil and hopefully more renewables, education, which you're taking advantage of right now, veterans affairs takes care of the people who have served in the military, and Homeland Security is the newest cabinet member and department. This was formed after 9-11 and is responsible for protecting us from terrorism. Now, below the pres and the VP and the cabinet are the hundreds of executive departments and agencies that help the president enforce the law. Organizations like the EPA or Environmental Protection Agency, the FBI, which is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration, making sure our food and our medicines are safe. These are your typical executive agencies. Here's just a another look at the departments and the structure of this branch. Now, in addition to these cabinet departments that fall underneath the president and the branch are what are known as independent agencies, functioning kind of on their own, like NASA bringing us into outer space, or the National Archives, which keeps records and copies of important documents and recordings and books. There are also independent regulatory commissions like the FCC, which oversees television and radio, the Securities Exchange and Federal Reserve that deal with our money and the stock market, and finally government corporations that function like companies but are really part of the federal government, like the post office or the train company Amtrak. I hope you're starting to see the size and scope of the executive branch. So let's look at an example of how the president and the executive branch enforce the laws using all of these agencies and departments by looking at some congressional laws. And and here is a law that started in the Senate, which you can tell by the S, which gives money to Homeland Security. Appropriations means money. And again, these days really means protecting us from terrorism. Here is a law that started in the House of Reps, which gives power to collect intelligence, which means kind of spying on terrorists. Now, both of these laws are meant to keep the country safe and keep track of our enemies. So it is the executive branch, headed up by the president, that is responsible for executing these laws to keep us safe from terrorism and by collecting information on these bad guys. And the president has a lot of agencies to help him do this, including the CIA, the FBI, the NSA. These are the big investigative agencies that keep track of the bad guys, but the military is also part of the executive branch, and they also have their own intelligence departments, like the Marines and the Army, and then we see agencies like the DEA or the Drug Enforcement Agency, and they also track bad guys involved with drugs, some of whom have ties to terrorism. So now that we see the huge structure of this branch and their main job, let's look at some other functions of the executive branch that can be found in the Constitution. We see the president can veto or reject bills passed by Congress, something we've talked about. The president can call Congress into session if there is an emergency and the members are not in Washington, D.C. The president can receive foreign leaders from other countries, make treaties with other countries, appoint the heads of executive agencies, pardon people who are convicted of a crime, and give an annual speech to Congress called the State of the Union. Now, we've covered the State of the Union speech in previous videos. The U.S. Constitution states that the president, quote, shall from time to time give to Congress information of the State of the Union, and to recommend measures he shall judge necessary, unquote. And this address, which for the past 100 years has been delivered in person, is a speech every January where the president will talk about the big issues facing America 
and what we should do to make the country better. Remember, the union is the country and the state is the condition that we are in. So the state of the union is a major address to Congress. The Constitution also states that the president has the power of vetoing any laws that they think would be bad for the country. Again, we've talked about this in previous videos. When the president vetoes a bill, it gets sent back to Congress where they can try to override this veto with a two-thirds vote, but this is extremely rare. Check out our video on how a law is made. And so this is the president's major check on the power of Congress. The Constitution also makes the president the head of the armed forces, and this is called the commander-in-chief role. The top generals and admirals all report to the president, and the president directs when and where they will fight. However, many of the day-to-day -day operations of a war are left to the various heads of these military branches, but remember, commander-in-chief, president, head of the military. The Constitution also gives the president the power to make treaties with other countries, and treaties are formal agreements. Maybe you've heard of peace treaties, but there can also be treaties about trade or cooperation. We talked about NAFTA and NATO in a previous video. It's important that you remember that treaties must be confirmed by the Senate. The president also appoints Supreme Court judges called justices and federal judges to their positions. And to appoint someone to a position is basically giving someone a job. This is a huge check over this branch as the judges serve for life. These judges usually serve for many years after the president has already been replaced by a new one. Now again, these judges have to be confirmed by the Senate, and here we see Obama appointing current Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, the first Latino Supreme Court Justice. The president also appoints or nominates heads of various departments and agencies. Here is Obama appointing the current head of the FBI, James Comey, but again, these nominations must be confirmed by the Senate. Finally, the Constitution gives the executive the power to pardon or forgive people who have been convicted of committing a crime. Now, these can be kind of controversial, but was put in in case the president feels that someone has been given too severe of a punishment. Here is former President Gerald Ford pardoning his predecessor, President Nixon, who was accused of the Watergate scandal. And this made a lot of Americans mad, something we'll learn about later this year. President Obama just recently pardoned about 30 people who were serving life sentences for nonviolent drug convictions. So those are the powers that the president have that are listed in the Constitution, and we refer to these as, quote, expressed power. The president, however, also has an implied power, which is known as executive orders. An executive order has the power of law. And while these aren't enacted that often, there have been some important ones throughout our history. For example, Abraham Lincoln offered the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the slaves during the Civil War, as an executive order. President Franklin Roosevelt locked up Japanese Americans during World War II via executive order. President Carter made it illegal for the CIA to assassinate members of other countries without permission. And President Obama offered an executive order placing a hold on all offshore oil drilling after the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, with all of the things that the president does besides enforcing the laws, we have come up with labels for the various roles that they play. Now, if you Google presidential roles, you'll see various lists, most of which are pretty much the same, but they're slightly different in some cases. We will use the following. Chief of State, Chief Executive, Chief Diplomat, Commander-in-Chief, Chief Legislator, Party Chief, and Chief Economist. And these, again, are presidential roles. Chief of State is kind of a symbolic role the president plays as the head of our country. Remember, the state is the country. The president will hold ceremonial events such as welcoming national championship sports teams, lighting the presidential Christmas tree, or here, holding an Easter egg hunt. Sometimes under this role, you will see welcoming leaders from other countries, but I like to 
filed that job under chief diplomat. Next is chief executive. Maybe you've heard the title of CEO, which means chief executive order. And that is for people who are the head of companies or corporations. And that's what this role is like for the president. He is, quote, the boss of this massive executive branch of 4 million people. And he not only appoints some of these people to their jobs, but he rules this whole administration that is charged with the job of enforcing the laws. Now, a diplomat is a person who represents their country to other countries. In addition to meeting with leaders from foreign countries, this role involves signing treaties with other countries and all of the interactions he has with countries around the world. The chief legislator implies the role the executive plays in making laws. By now you know it's the job of the legislative branch, which we call Congress, to make laws. But as we said, the president often suggests laws. Here we see a picture of President Obama promoting his idea for a law that was passed known as the Affordable Health Care Act. However, even though Congress passed this law, it is so associated with the president that it's known as Obamacare. The president, as you know, also signs bills, which turns them into laws. So chief legislator is the president's involvement in the lawmaking process. Now, as chief of the party, the president is kind of the figurehead leader of whichever political party they are in. This often involves supporting fellow party members who are running for office, as we see former President Bush doing here. The economy describes how we are doing as a country financially. Not only does the executive branch write the budget for the government and release a major economic report, the president helps guide the economy to fight things like unemployment and inflation while promoting trade with other countries and business opportunities for the nation's companies. And finally, the role we already discussed, commander-in-chief, making the president the head of the military. Now, this is a good time to discuss the president's role in the declaration of war. I think many people think that it is the president who declares war, but it's not. It's Congress who declares war. However, if you look at this chart right here, you will see that the United States has fought in our last five wars without Congress officially declaring war. All of the blue wars were fought without Congress declaring war. Presidents have sent troops to fight around the world more than 200 times, but you will see that America has only officially declared war on other countries four times, the ones in red. Now, Presidents have gotten permission from Congress to fight in these wars, which sometimes will be called conflicts instead of wars. One of these wars, aka conflicts, was the Vietnam War. And this unpopular war was greatly escalated by Presidents Johnson and Nixon. And Congress decided enough was enough. To reclaim their power over fighting wars, they enacted the War Powers Resolution of 1973. This law states that the President can only use military force for 60 days without congressional approval. And then they have 30 days to withdraw troops if Congress does not agree with the conflict. This law still gives the president the power to immediately respond to military threats, but they will need to work with Congress if they want to continue fighting after 90 days. So these are the roles of the president. And as you can see, the president is responsible for much more than just enforcing or executing the law. Now, if it seems like the president is a a hugely powerful position, let's review some checks on that presidential power. While the president can propose and veto laws, Congress can override the veto. While the president appoints people to major positions, those appointments must be confirmed by the Senate. And while the president can make treaties and use military force, it's the Senate that must ratify those treaties, and it's Congress that declares war. Finally, it's Congress that controls all of the government's money, so they can always stop the president from doing something by controlling the money they would need to do it. And if the president is doing things that aren't good for the country, they can be removed by Congress, which is known as impeachment. Okay, so we covered a lot of material today. Next time we will finish up the president with reviewing how someone becomes or runs for president, which will be much shorter, I promise, since we've covered so much. Let's review. What is a requirement to become the president? Well, you must be 35 years old or 
resident for 14 years, a natural born citizen. We'll be going over that in the next video. What is the job of the executive branch? Remember, executive, execute, to execute or enforce the laws. What power is involved when the president chooses a new Supreme Court justice? What do we call that? When he chooses someone, it's called appointments. What power would be used to let someone out of jail? Remember, they are pardoned. What power does the president have to try to get rid of laws they don't like? The veto. True or false? The description of the cabinet can be found in the Constitution. Remember George Washington? Did he look in the Constitution? No. False. There's nothing about the cabinet in the Constitution. What role is the president which makes him the head of the military? That's the commander in chief. Powers listed in the Constitution for the president are known as, they're not enumerated, that was Congress, they are expressed powers. What role of the president is ceremonial? Kind of the symbolic leader of the state, the country, the chief of state. What is it called when the president signs an agreement with another country? Very often these are peace, but they are treaties. Treaties and presidential appointments must be confirmed by whom? It is not all of Congress, it is the Senate. True or false, the president can declare war on another country. Well, even though he's been fighting them, it's false, it's Congress who declares war. And that is it. Thanks for watching, guys. Up next, again, we're gonna look at electing the president, so be sure to subscribe. Just a reminder, teachers, this PowerPoint with lessons and activities is available at Teachers Pay Teachers. Just search for Mr. Raymond's Civics EOC Academy. Again, Keep up the good work, guys. You are going to ace that exam.